In 2016, police in Martin County, Florida were called to a garage belonging to John Stevens III. They found 19-year-old Austin Haruf on top of Stevens, biting his face and growling. Stevens and his wife, found nearby, both died from injuries inflicted by Haruf, whom one psychologist described as suffering from clinical lycanthropy delusions. In other words, Haruf believed himself to be a werewolf. The notion that people could transform themselves into animals goes back thousands of years, and in more recent centuries, transformation into wolves has become one of the most common manifestations of this belief, which, as the aforementioned story indicates, still persists to this day. Werewolfism was attested to in legal codes and scholarly works, and, similar to the more famous witch trials in colonial America, some people in Europe were prosecuted and convicted for the crimes of being werewolves, with many confessions coming under the duress of torture. Today I'll be touching upon a long history of werewolves in fiction and reality, as well as some of the most famous supposed werewolves of recent times. The concept of people shapeshifting into animals has its origins deep in prehistory, possibly relating to warriors who wore animal skins to emulate ferocious beasts. The earliest literary reference we have to a man-wolf transformation comes from the Epic of Gilgamesh, composed around 2100 BC. Such transformations were common in ancient Greek and Roman sources, many of them perceived to be factual. Herodotus skeptically described the Nuri, a people who lived in modern Belarus around 500 BC, as becoming wolves for a few days every year, which could simply be a reference to bundling up in furs during cold weather. The mythological Greek Arcadian king Lycaon killed a man, his son in some versions of the story, and fed him to Zeus, whereupon the god transformed the king into a wolf. The poet Ovid gave a graphic description of the transformation process, which, in prose form, sounds like it was ripped from a modern novel or movie script. Lycaon, terrified, takes to flight, and reaching the remote plains fills them with savage howling, and in vain endeavors to speak. His mouth foams with rage. His garments are changed into hair, his arms into legs. He becomes a wolf, and still retains strong marks of what he was. His hoariness is the same. The same rage and violence appear in his countenance. His eyes sparkle as formerly, and he is still the same image of savage fierceness. As you can probably guess, Lycaon gets his name from the Greek root of wolf, Lycos, which is where the term lycanthropy also comes from. References to werewolves exist in medieval texts, and while they may not have been literal, it's possible that their inclusion helped shape later events. Written in the early 11th century, the ecclesiastical ordinances of King Canute the Great explicitly mentioned that shepherds should be very watchful of werewolves. In 1215, English lawyer Gervais of Tilbury wrote about a knight named Rimbaud de Puget, who was driven into poverty and lived in the woods, eventually becoming a wolf and attacking people. The werewolves of Ossory, a kingdom in Ireland, were mentioned by the English historian Gerald of Wales in the late 12th century. In his account, a priest encounters a wolf who speaks to him and says that he and his wife were cursed to become wolves every seven years. The wolf leads the priest to his sick wife. The priest performs last rites, and the wolf peels off his wife's wolf skin, revealing the woman underneath. The tale inspired a later Norse story that referenced St. Patrick facing a rebellious clan of Irish pagans, whom God turns into wolves every seven years. All of these supposedly factual accounts may be using wolves as allegories for bad people. Pagans in Gerald's tale, bandits in the case of law codes, or a knight becoming savage after being driven into the wild. Gerald agreed with the early Christian philosopher St. Augustine of Hippo, who insisted that only God could bring about true metamorphosis, and that demons could only trick or confuse people into thinking that they had been transformed. Later Christians, however, would not be so dismissive of the notion that evil powers could turn a man into a wolf. In 1502, French shepherd Pierre Bergot was struggling to tend his sheep during a vicious storm. Three men, clad in black and riding black horses, offered to protect the sheep. All Bergot had to do was renounce God and kiss the man's hand, which was as cold as that of a corpse. Some years later, Burgot met up with a man named Michel Verdun, who provided him with an ointment that the two applied to their bodies, whereupon each believed that they had transformed into wolves and committed a series of horrific murders, which included mangling and consuming small children. The pair confessed to these crimes, as well as mating with she-wolves in their 1521 trial. The two men, as well as a third accomplice, were burned at the stake. One of the most famous werewolf cases was that of Peter Stump, a wealthy German farmer who confessed that the devil had given him a magic belt that allowed him to transform into a wolf. In wolf form, he fed on farm animals, as well as two pregnant women and over a dozen children, one of whom was his son, whose brain he devoured. He was also found guilty of having sex with his daughter and fathering a child with her. For his crime spree, which lasted 25 years, 
he was sentenced to a horrific death on October 31st, 1589. Flesh was torn from his body in ten places with red-hot pincers, followed by his arms and legs. Then his limbs were broken with the blunt side of an axe head before he was beheaded and his body burned on a pyre. I found plenty of other instances of men accused of turning into wolves, along with their trials and sentences, and they're usually just a stomach churning. I'll spare you the details, but you can find links to the various and bloody accounts in the description below. While it's certain that nobody was actually a shapeshifter, mutilated corpses typically required an explanation. As in witch trials, werewolf confessions were often extracted under duress, but there's enough evidence to indicate that several of the accused actually committed their crimes. The very real dual threats of wild animals and evil men might have coalesced into a genuine belief in weird creatures combining these two dangers. Tossing some totally reliable eyewitness accounts of people changing into wolves and vice versa, as well as the ardent belief in the devil and his ability to corrupt, and werewolf became an easy explanation for grisly murders. That's not even accounting for what might have been true mental illness on the part of the accused that led him to act like a wolf, such as in the story I related at the start of this video or similar hallucinations brought on by mind-altering substances, which might have been present in the ointment used by Burgo and Verdun. Some media, especially games that allow for free choice, present an alternate view of werewolves. Sure, they might still be beast-like and violent, but they don't necessarily have to be serial killers, and, like many of today's monsters, might even be good or at least sympathetic figures. This isn't a strictly modern interpretation. A 12th century French poet named Marie wrote Bisclavre, which is about a noble baron who, three days a week, vanishes from his home to become a wolf. His wife learns his secret and, full of loathing, hides his clothes, which he needs to return to human form. The baron disappears. A year later, the king finds a remarkably tame wolf and allows it into his household. A deep friendship blossoms between man and beast. During a feast, the previously docile wolf attacks a knight, shocking the king and his court. A short time later, the king, with his pet wolf, comes calling on the knight's wife, the former wife of the missing baron. The wolf lunges at the woman, tearing off her nose. The king questions the woman and learns of how she disposed of her previous husband. He has the baron's clothes brought forth, the wolf returns to his human form, and they live happily ever after. Well, except for the woman and her knightly husband, who are banished from the realm. And she's still missing her nose. That was a purely fictional tale, though. Nobody would ever use the but I'm a good werewolf defense to escape real life consequences, right? Well, on April 28th, 1691, a court in Swedish Livonia heard the case of a man known as Old Thys. He admitted to being a werewolf, but he had good reason. According to a witness at his trial, Thys and several others traveled to hell three times a year to steal back grain that had been stolen by sorcerers in league with the devil. The werewolves do not serve the devil, for they take away from him that which the sorcerers brought him, and for that reason the devil is so hostile to them that he cannot bear them. Rather, he has them driven off with iron goads, as if they were dogs, for the werewolves are God's hounds. Everything the werewolves do profits people best, for if they didn't exist and the devil made off with the prosperity, robbed or stole it, all the world's prosperity would depart. If I'm ever accused of being a werewolf, I want that guy to stand as my lawyer. Thice was given the option to repent and denounce his life as a werewolf, but he stubbornly stuck to his fangs and insisted all he had done was in God's service. For his crimes, not only as a werewolf but for practicing folk magic and medicine, Thice was sentenced to a public flogging and banishment from the land. Compared to how other werewolves were sentenced, I'd say he got off pretty light. So, werewolves have been with us, both in literature and in real life, for a very long time, born from genuine dangers posed by wolves and a solid helping of real human cruelty, with a dash of superstition tossed in. But what about the most common myth that we have about battling werewolves? That they can only be harmed by silver, specifically a silver bullet. Early stories of silver's effectiveness as a weapon isn't limited to werewolves. Many supernatural creatures, including witches and vampires, counted silver among their weaknesses due to its shine and apparent purity. In a general sense though, silver's not a very effective weapon, being much softer than steel and other weapon-grade metals. Two episodes of Mythbusters address the topic of silver bullets, concluding that they're both less accurate and have less penetrative power than conventional bullets. The Oxford English Dictionary pins the first reference to a silver bullet as coming from a 1648 document that suggested two types of bullets, of silver and gold, drawn like lots for electoral purposes in England. As a weapon, silver bullets are first referenced in 1678 as part of the Popish Plot, a fictitious anti-Catholic conspiracy 
that suggested King Charles II would be assassinated with a silver bullet so that the wound would not heal. It's possible that the hoaxer wanted to portray the king's would-be assassins as thinking him to be so monstrous as to require special ammunition. Silver as a weapon against monsters gained traction in fictional works like Bram Stoker's Dracula in 1897 and the 1941 film The Wolfman, in which the title character is beaten to death with a silver-headed cane. That movie may have inspired the only instance I could find of silver being used as a weapon against a werewolf, even if it turned out to be false. In the 1760s, the French province of Gévaudan was terrorized by a beast that witnesses described as being like a wolf yet not a wolf, sometimes as large as the horse and with an unnaturally long tail. Over three years, the beast, or beasts, was responsible for around 200 attacks, resulting in over 100 fatalities, many of whom were found partially eaten. A peasant woman named Marie Jean Vallée managed to defend herself with a spear during one attack, wounding the beast, and hunters that were called in killed several large wolves. But the attacks continued, leading some to think that it was the same beast, either returned from the dead or otherwise not capable of being killed by conventional means. Whatever it was, it was eventually done in by a local hunter named Jean Chastel, who melted down silver medals of the Virgin Mary to create his bullets. At least that's what author Henri Porat wrote in 1946, five years after the Wolfman hit theaters. The beast of Gévaudan was real, but Chastel probably used regular ammunition. There's simply no verified proof of silver bullets ever being used in any real monster hunting or king slaying capacity. Exactly what the Beast of Gévaudan was is still a matter of speculation, with some theories being that it was a lion, hyena, or war dog, possibly under the control of a human serial killer. Its identification as a werewolf lived on in many future works, including the MTV series Teen Wolf, which includes a character who's revealed to be the legendary beast. In the show, the peasant woman Marie Jean Vallée was the beast's brother and the first werewolf hunter, and the beast is killed by a sword made from her spear. I like when fantasy shows or movies include links to history like that. It gives them a plausible root in reality and makes for a more convincing plot overall, reminding us that supernatural beings like werewolves aren't that far removed from reality, whether in the past like the werewolf trials of Europe, or the present like the case of Austin Haroof. Even if they're not 100% real, they tap into humankind's primal fears and need to explain the unexplainable, making it that much more interesting and rewarding to discover the reality behind the myth. Thank you so much for watching this video about werewolves, and feel free to leave a comment letting me know what you thought or if you have a topic you'd like me to cover in the future. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you want to see more videos about the true origins of fantasy and modern media. Until next time, remember not to let your spouse hide your clothes when you go out and about as a werewolf.